You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do Mini. I'm your host, Abraham. And I'm your host, Shane. We are a psychology podcast. We talk about all of the things that people do, and sometimes we talk about the things that people do explicitly, using explicit terms. Yeah, today is all about porn, and where it came from, and what it is, and and all the fun things to go along with that. (laughs) Yeah, this is a short form series that we do that uh, we normally release these sort of 45 minutes, hour long-ish, or even longer sometimes episodes. On Mondays, we release these short series uh, that are meant to be a bite-sized dive into a single topic. And one that has come up before is that, uh, what is what is porn even really? Part of this stems from a 1964 case, Jacobellis, 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 I'm going to say, Jacobellis versus Ohio, which came before the Supreme Court and the, at the time, Justice, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart was frustrated at deciding the qualifications for uh, the threshold of violations for obscenity laws. And when asked to define the threshold for obscenity, he said, quote, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of materials I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description referring to hardcore pornography, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it, and the motion picture involved in this case is not that, end quote. Huh. Well, Justice Stewart, I believe we can help. Let's take our clothes off and dive in. But actually, before we do that, I have a question for you. Did you ever do the thing when we were kids where, like, you had to come up with your porn name and it was like, like the street, it was like the, you know, your, your, your pet's name and then like your middle name or your pet's name and the street you were born on or anything like that. Did you ever do any of that? Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. My porn name, and actually it was pretty good. I would have been, um, Bo Prospect. Bo Prospect. Oh, that's good. Mine would have been, it was either Buster Thomas or Buster Brooks, depending on, on which one I went with, but it was always Buster something, which I was like, that, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good for that. That does work pretty good. So yeah, the idea here uh, with this case is that it was the sort of, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. And that whole line of phrase has actually been used. It had been used before. It has definitely been used since to essentially say, like, you kind of just know. If you know, you know. Otherwise, you don't know. But that being said, we're talking specifically about porn. We're going to help define that because uh, it it, it can be tough to do so, I guess. And so we're going to unpack that. And first, let's get into the etymology of this word. This comes from the Greek porne, I'm guessing, porne maybe, which meant prostitute, and graphien, which meant write. And so pornographos meant writing about prostitutes. And that eventually became the English word pornography in the mid-1800s albeit yet still undefined. Yeah, also a fairly new term, which is like really fascinating, given that it was like only the 1800s that it started showing up. Yeah. Now, the scope of the conundrum of defining obscene and explicit materials is made evident by the rapidly shifting policies of online media platforms, particularly social media. That does make it a little bit more complex when we start talking about what specifically classifies as pornography. Yeah, so for example, is an exposed female breast pornographic? It depends, but probably not if it's being used in like a medical training class or sex education or for uh, it's not pornographic to a baby who is breastfeeding. But Facebook and other social media companies did initially censor these images as being essentially porn or lewd, obscene images, but they were criticized for doing so for someone who, for example, it was breastfeeding or it was something medical or whatnot. And so they subsequently rewrote their policies to allow for these depictions in certain scenarios. Right. In body parts that were dubbed sexual in nature, this would include body parts that identify as primary or secondary sex organs. So breasts, penis, vulva, vagina, anus, all that stuff, right? They're all generally not permitted in widely available websites that provide space for photos and videos like Instagram, Facebook, and all that, except when the context is not sexual. So, for example, you can find videos and photos of of, on these platforms of women giving birth, of STIs, breastfeeding, genital surgery, fairly like you can find all that stuff without censorship. As a matter of fact, even Spotify, like album covers, if it's like part of the art 
can be pretty explicit. I mean, all you got to do is look up. There's a, a typo negative record that like it's literal. It's penetrative sex on the cover and it's still up there and people don't really say anything about it. All right. It's like a close up too. You're like, you can't mistake it. So <laughs> you're like, Oh, that I know what that is. Uh-huh. Yeah. As you said, even in, in art and in these other mediums, um, it's considered essentially not pornographic books and podcasts will describe explicitly sexual scenarios that are really just a part of a broader narrative arc relevant for the characters in this totally fictionalized story, or even sometimes they're autobiographical stories, but it's, it's meant to serve part of the narrative context there too. And this is often considered acceptable except in Florida and in Idaho and Kentucky, yeah. probably. Oof. Don't even get me started. Tennessee, for sure. <laughs> yeah. But those are, are situations where, again, it's not actually considered pornographic. It is just an element of of the, the art or whatever the depiction that's going on uh, that's part of a story. Right. And furthermore, you can actually find all sorts of videos and photographs on pornographic websites that do not include exposed body parts at all. So the exposure does not necessarily make it pornographic. Right. Yeah, there seems to be a really crucial element here to what is pornography and one that has turned out to be and will continue to be very difficult to actually prove. And we will get into that after these pornographic ads. All right, so that's all sort of getting to the important caveats and complications in unpacking what pornography is. So let's go ahead and define it then. Yeah, so pornography is any generated or recorded content that is intended to elicit sexual erotic reactions from the audience. This is why pornography might include an auditory description of something that might involve a sexual act and might not but be intended to stimulate sexual excitement in the audience either way. So I think there's a key piece here, this idea that we're talking about the intention of eliciting sexual erotic reactions from people. And that is essentially the part that is impossible to prove is like, you know, you can't necessarily declare what the intention is. And there's so many examples. And like I said, one important feature of trying to draw a line of delineation is when people who make and host pornography, what they choose as their content. There's a whole category called safe for work or SFW, this category of porn that does not feature explicit sexual imagery or acts that is still featured as part of a suite of things offered by pornographic websites. Right. And some sexual fetishes do not include sexual images or acts, but might include specific clothing or scenarios that the viewer might be sexually excited by. So uh, it doesn't necessarily require, again, penetrative sex or even acts of sex at all. Right. And so this comes to this this point here of like, how can you prove the material was what the material was intended to elicit? You can't. You just can't. Yeah. Even uh, the participation on a pornographic medium does not mean that the content was created with the intent of being sexually arousing. There are pieces of art, movie, television shows that have scenes that maybe contain nudity or something that is somewhat sexual, even if it doesn't include anything exposed, that will then be clipped and moved to a pornographic website. Again, because some people find they sort of fetishize that element of the depiction in the art. And so it becomes something that someone finds arousing, even though it wasn't intended for it. But then it's slotted into a delivery mechanism that is intended for an audience who's seeking that kind of sexual sexual arousal. Right. And so even content that was designed to avoid being sexually arousing might be for some people with specific fetishes. I mean, that's how we end up on the subject of couches in this episode. <laughs> Which inside a uh, very topical reference there. So yeah, I think the point the, the point of all of this is like things First of all, you, you can't you can't really control how someone responds to their own arousal towards something else. Like People will find sexual arousal out of things that do not contain nudity. People will not find sexual arousal from things that do contain nudity. There is no clear line of delineation about what this could be. It really has to do with how it's being consumed and the intention for which it was made or the intention for which it was platformed in a particular space. That is essentially what pornography does. And I think all of that is to say the main point here is chill out for all of you who are concerned about this. As long as it is consensual and no one is getting hurt, or at least not seriously hurt, depending on what you're you're consensually engaging (laughs) in there. 
it's really none of your business why or what someone chooses to observe in their media. It really isn't. It, it just doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Right. Like someone might get like really get off on uh, cartoon frogs. It's weird. They might want to seek help for that. But should we start making it so that there are no more cartoon frogs? No, that's stupid. Like it, it just doesn't matter what someone else is sexually aroused by in the media they consume. Again, consent, consent, consent. Those of you naysayers are going to hear this and say, what about child pornography? Children cannot consent. Consent is everything. So like that is one that does not count as a thing that people should be able to consume. That is, of course, where we draw the line in all of this. Yes. Think someone where someone is sexually coerced. That does not count. That is not consent. So like those things are not th- like the things where consent is not obtained. That is obscene. That is lewd. That is stuff that should not be uh, facilitated because those are that is exploitation of real humans and should not be tolerated. Right. But as long as it's consent, then it is really none of anyone's business what people choose to consume as far as their own entertainment and arousal. Right. Absolutely. So as far as why porn exists, that one is super easy. So sex is something that we are generally biologically prepared to find enjoyable because this facilitates the continuation of our species. It makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Right. All of the things that accompany sex can therefore elicit a sexual response in us, even when it seems far removed from the actual sex. For example, some people find making a mess with food very arousing, even though this is not inherently sexual. Do your own thing. That's totally fine. And most importantly, Anything that we can enjoy that can be commoditized will be commoditized and sold to a willing audience. So that's kind of what we have done historically. The The idea of sex and pornography and sex toys has existed since humans have existed. So just relax about it. As long as everybody's consenting, just know that like people will also find a way to sell it too now. Yes, that's basically it. All right, I think that is all that I have to say about porn. Anything you'd like to add? Nothing else on my end. All right, if you'd like to support the show, you can join us on Patreon, pick up some merch, leave us a rating review, like and subscribe. If you'd like to tell us about porn, you can email us directly at info at www.dwdwdpodcast.com or reach us on the social media platforms. Otherwise, that is all that I have. Thank you for listening. This is Abraham. This is Shane. We're out. Bye. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day.